Imagine yourself walking through a dining hall. What are you going to choose? A pizza or maybe a salad? When you are choosing between pizza and a salad, you instinctively know where you are going to end up. In the world of molecules, Markovnikov's rule helps us predict similar choices. Hey everyone, Victor is here, your guide to all things organic chemistry, and in this video I want to talk about the Markovnikov's rule, what exactly it is, and why it is one of the most misunderstood rules in organic chemistry. So grab your cup of coffee, a notebook to jot down the important bits, hit that like button for good luck on the test, and let's dig in! In 1870s, Russian chemist Vladimir Markovnikov published his observations of the outcomes of the hydrohalogenation of alkenes. He observed that when an alkene reacts with the hydrogen halides like HCl, HBr or HI, the halide typically ends up on the more substituted atom of the double bond, while the hydrogen on the least substituted one. And to make sure that we are crystal clear on the terminology here, the more substituted atom is the one that is connected to more other atoms that are not hydrogens. So if a carbon atom is connected to three other carbons, it is going to be more substituted than the one that is connected only to one other carbon. In the times of Markovnikov, chemists didn't know about carbocations and had very vague idea about the mechanisms of organic reactions in general. It would take over 50 years for chemists to develop the first good idea of the mechanisms and what's happening in reactions to begin with. So at the time of Markovnikov, chemists could only describe what they saw experimentally, but they couldn't explain their observations. Now, of course, we know better. So people started calling products with the halide on the more substituted atom just the Markovnikov's product, while the molecules with the halide on the less substituted carbon at the same time were appropriately called the anti-Markovnikov products. And this notion slowly but steadily spread onto other reactions and people started calling any molecule with the group of interest on the uh, more substituted atom as the Markovnikov's product. And now we often come across the reactions that that make Markovnikov's alcohols, or Markovnikov halohydrines, or Markovnikov vicinal dihalides, etc., which naturally makes it very confusing what exactly that entails in every single case. Well, now I'm going to tell you something very important here. Markovnikov's rule, just like the anti-Markovnikov's rules, do not exist. They are a fiction. Likewise, it's really silly to talk about the Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov products. Both rules follow the same fundamental mechanistic principle of organic chemistry. In any reaction, will always form the most stable reactive intermediates. And for as long as you follow this fundamental principle while working through your reactions, you will always come up with the correct product and will never need to memorize whether the reaction follows the Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov or whatever else rule. This, of course, means that you need to have a firm understanding of the mechanisms of the reactions that you're working through. Today, we know that the Markovnikov's rule boils down to one simple principle, stability. So if I took this molecule, 2-methylbut2-in, and reacted that with hydrogen halide, like let's say HBr, the first step can produce two different carbocations, the tertiary carbocation and the secondary carbocation. And as we know, the tertiary carbocation is more stable than the secondary one. Thus, we'll keep that one and discard the secondary one. Does that mean that we do not make any quantity of the secondary carbocation at all? No, it does not. The secondary carbocation will show up, but it will be present in a very small quantity. The greater the stability difference for something like a secondary versus tertiary carbocation, we'll have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of tertiary carbocations forming for each secondary one at a given system. So in the next step, when the halide anion attacks our carbocation, we are going to end up with the final product that looks like that, where I have the bromine on the more substituted atom of my molecule. And so this way I actually don't have to remember that this reaction follows the Markovnikov rule, I just have to remember that all reactions make the most stable intermediate. As simple as that. 
So you're probably thinking, well, what about the anti-Markovnikov hydrohalogenation? Well, don't worry, this reaction is not a rule breaker either. It just plays, you know, different game, radical mechanisms. Till 1933 it was called peroxide effect, since people truly had no idea what was going on there, till Maurice Karash gave the radical mechanism explanation. And despite the fact that uh, we have a different mechanism for this reaction, we still follow the same fundamental principle, we make the most stable intermediate. So let's say I'll react this styrene molecule with my hydrogen bromide in the presence of the organic peroxides. This reaction indeed produces the major product with the bromine on the less substituted atom. But if we look at the intermediate of this reaction, a radical in this case, we'll see that this radical is on the more substituted carbon. Carbocations and radicals follow the same stability pattern, so the more substituted the radical is, the more stable it is going to be. So we still keep true to our fundamental principle of making the most stable intermediate. And of course, working through the mechanism every single time is quite tedious and takes a lot of time. If you're pressed for time, here is a quick tip. The electrophile typically goes onto the less busy carbon, while the nucleophile chooses the more substituted one. So if you know the reagents for each of your reactions and can classify them as nucleophiles and electrophiles, you can easily predict which group goes where. But remember, knowing the why is better than just memorizing. I always advise to practice your mechanisms regardless, so you can quickly run through the mechanism of any reaction and broad strokes in your head. This way you'll always get the correct product. And if your functional group is on the more substituted atom, we'll just call it Markovnikov product. Likewise, if your functional group is on the less substituted atom, that is the anti-Markovnikov product. As simple as that. That means that you need to know your mechanisms and know what is the nucleophile and what is the electrophile in each reaction. But if you try to blindly memorize which reaction is Markovnikov and which reaction is anti-Markovnikov, you will eventually get overwhelmed and confuse those when it matters the most, aka on the test. You can write down this table as a quick reference guide for the most common reactions, but remember, memorization will never trample understanding. So rather Rather than trying to memorize it, always emphasize the why factor and consciously think mechanistically about your reactions. So for each reaction that I have here on the screen, do write the mechanism with some sort of a sample alkene so you know where things are and what's going on there. So there you have it. Markovnikov's rule isn't that mysterious as it seems, right? With a little practice, you'll be predicting those reaction outcomes like a pro. Thank you for watching. If you learned something new today, please give this video a like as it really helps to promote it and help more students see it. Also, subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates and ring the bell if you haven't done so yet. Watch this video next and I will see you tomorrow.